Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors. Phil, good morning to you. Don't get into anything just yet because I got to do something else first, but I just wanted to bring you in and say good morning. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Are you en route back from your workout this morning? I am en route to work, so I am, uh, I'm getting ready to pull over, though, so I cannot lose service this morning. Very important morning. <laughs> <laughs> D- D- Dylan came in so sheepishly quiet this morning. He had so little to say. He snuck in. He's, I saw him, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him glance over with the corner of his eye to see if I was ready to bring it, and I, I just didn't say anything to him at all. I just let him kind of slink in there and try to get away with it this morning, Dylan. <laughs> I've just been dreading this, this segment. <laughs> well, you're going to have to just wait a little bit longer because Mr. Gilstrap has a bit of an announcement to make first here. I do have a bit of an announcement to make. And um, I, I got a movie deal set up at Netflix over the weekend. Woo! Congratulations. Thank you very much. Got the call. Actually, I've been sitting on this news for a while. Uh, Six Minutes to Freedom, the nonfiction book I did about a Delta Force rescue of Kurt Muse in uh, Modelo, out of Modelo, no, <laughs> Modelo Prison in the opening moments of Operation Just Cause. This is based on a true story. It is based on a true story. And um, it's um, being, it's kind of, it's a new model. Uh, It's it's actually been under option. It's kind of a quiet option. It's called a shopping agreement uh, from Jared Rosenberg, who's uh, really kind of a hot screenwriter right now. His movie Flight Risk, starring Mel Gibson, directed by Mel Gibson as well, and uh, Mark Wahlberg comes out in January. And um, he hooked up with uh, Toby Jaffe, who is a producer from Hunter Killer, uh, which is a TV series that was on uh, for quite some time, I think 2018, 2019. And um, so there was a bit of a bidding war for this thing between uh, 20th Century and Netflix, Netflix One. So this should be a movie sometime in 2026. So I'm very happy. Will you star as well, John? No. No, Why not? no Why because not? I'm doing all the stunts. <laughs> you, you missed the two big yeah. words in that one, though, Bill. Bidding war. That, you know what bidding war means, yeah. don't you? Does so. that mean he's going to take us out for dinner? <laughs> no, Probably he won't take not, us out. No. <laughs> so, no, I first heard about this. I was we were in um, in Joy's um, birthday trip to uh, Greece. I got a phone call. We were having dinner, literally at the base of the Acropolis, when my agent uh, Matthew Snyder at CAA called, and we got this shopping agreement thing got started and then just on thursday night we got word it was announced in variety magazine so you know, that's good news. Yeah, i'm gonna that, say this here good news. bill and, and and i know i say a lot of things tongue-in-cheek and with a little sense of humor attached to it at least in my own brain uh, but uh because john is in here co-hosting two three sometimes four times a week it, it gets lost in the fact that it becomes such an everyday, oh, yeah, that's just John Gilstrap thing, that I'm going to embarrass him a little bit. This guy's a big deal over here, right? He, <laughs> he is. is. A big deal, I mean, yeah. he's, he's, when I, you threw out New York Times bestselling author, uh, but this is only one of the things that's in the works for, for stuff that he's got cooking. I mean, this is, uh, this is the kind of person where if he was, like, coming through town, look, can we get John Gilstrap on the show? That would be a pretty big accomplishment. The fact that he kind of just breezes in here three, four days a week kind of normalizes everything. But this guy's a pretty big deal over here, and I'm not saying that to be a smart aleck. Well, I'm glad you said that because you said it much more appropriate than I did. My comment was, well, what's the big deal? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm frequently in, in Greece, and my agent calls me for a multi-billion dollar not just, uh, deal. Oh, no, well, CAA. Yeah, yeah, not it's crazy CAA, but it's, CAA uh, is a big-time <laughs> agency. You're going to be somebody to be represented by CAA. It's not just somebody that you got, like, you can't write, like, a short story. Yeah. Well, I guess some agency representation. CAA will take me. But let's follow my uh, my <laughs> fantasy for a couple minutes. My agent would call and say, yeah, Bill, we got this contract going. It's going to pay you 50 cents, 30 cents perhaps, if you're lucky. And in John's case, we're talking about yeah. multi-billions probably. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. You notice that seat's a little higher this morning. Yeah. That's because of the wallet, baby. No, it's a, it's, it, the headphones are a little wider. That's all. Well, <laughs> congratulations. When, does, maybe, when might we see it on TV? How long does this process take? Uh, it should be 2026. And we, what will the series be called? It's not it? a series. It's a, it's a feature. It's a feature. Uh, right now, Six Minutes to Freedom is the name of the book. I don't know what the name of the, okay. the film it, It's listed in Variety as Six Minutes to Freedom. Do you know who will star in it? No, not yet. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, cool. Still now, when play. did you write the book, John? I wrote the book in twenty uh, in uh, two thousand six. Mm-hmm. 
So it's this is not the first time it's been under option, but it's the first time it's been attached to a studio. So that's that's a really big deal. That's Con- awesome. Congratulations, man. John. Thank that's well deserved. Thank you. So. Thank you. Uh, financial Phil, good morning to you once again, sir. Now, sorry, uh, Dylan, I put it off for you as long as I could. <laughs> <He> had, <laughs> Dylan couldn't fully enjoy all that because he knows what's coming. Phil, good morning, sir. Good morning, guys, and congratulations, John. I saw that on uh, on Facebook over the weekend. So someone had shared that, and I thought, boy, I'm. Uh, I'm in the presence of greatness on Monday morning. And we take it for granted. We take it for granted. So, Phil, did you do anything Sunday between 1 and, I don't know, and say 4 o'clock? Oh, see, 1 to before. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Yeah, well, I was was glued to the TV watching Pittsburgh not score a single touchdown but still beat the dirty Baltimore Ravens. And, And this morning I caught in, and I was Dylan didn't have the same pep in his voice. That he typically has. If if tones could speak, he would. He said at eight thirty, the very second I called in, oh, I cannot. Well, I cannot deal with this jerk this morning. But I tried to take it easy on him. That was a typical Pittsburgh Baltimore game. It was typical from a lot of ways. It was hard fought. There was a little bit of chippiness. And it was typical because Pittsburgh won. Again, you know, eight out of the last nine. <laughs> yes, you know, there. Phil, you're demonstrating to all these mothers what it's like to be a good winner. Gracious. Very a gracious, gracious winner. A gracious, <laughs> gracious winner. winner. <laughs> Dylan, would you is agree Phil's a song? gracious winner and so am I? Is that what this is? <laughs> is that what this is? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if think about this from my perspective. I work with Dylan, Nick, and Colin on a regular basis. And there's a Redskins fan, or Commanders as they're now called, two Ravens fans. And uh, uh, Colin and Dylan are West Virginia fans as well. And Pitt beat West Virginia in football and basketball this year in the last two weekends. And that was Friday for basketball, by the way. It was a blowout. And then the last uh, two weekends, the Steelers beat Washington and Baltimore. So I, I could have potentially been surrounded by people just talking all kind of stuff on me here. And I have escaped it <laughs> very cleanly <laughs> because of the wins on my side of the ledger here. You're getting off lucky, right? right I, I now, am, you know? I, I, but I'm enjoying it. I, I am enjoying it very As much. It does, Dylan, it does confound me that whenever the Steelers play the Ravens, the national coverage of it is such that the Steelers never have a chance. Oh, they'll never, they can't do, they, they've got no chance to beat the Ravens. And as, as Phil said, eight of the last nine, the Steelers have beat the Ravens. And whenever the Steelers beat the Ravens, there's always an excuse. Well, Lamar didn't play. Well, Lamar was hurt. Well, they called too many penalties. Well, they dropped passes. There's always a reason why the Steelers shouldn't have won the game, but they've won eight of the last night. At some point along the way, can we all not be surprised when the Steelers and Ravens play that it's going to be a close game and the Steelers may have a chance to win? And, you know, those games are billed as games with bad, bad blood between the two teams. And it was evidence yesterday. Seems like they were getting ready to fight at every between every down. A lot of pushing and shoving, Dylan. A lot of pushing. A lot of a lot, fist there, there was a lot of it. Uh, Mike Tomlin's a better coach than John Harbaugh. That's, I think that's the long and the short of it for me for why they've won so many so recently. Like the the Ravens might might have the better roster o- overall. Uh, they usually have, and I think that's a big reason why a lot of people will pick the the Ravens to win these games. But then the, the we saw it against you know earlier this year against the Raiders uh, for for the Ravens. They just have these games where it just like confoundedly just commit all of these mis- mistakes. Justin Tucker misses two field goals. Derrick Henry fumbles for the first time in this year. Isaiah likely another another fumble. That that was, you know, six points the Ravens lost out on and six points they gave to the Steelers right there. And then all the penalties that the Ravens committed. It just they, they beat themselves in, in big games like this. It's almost like they get too hyped up. I think that's what Lamar Jackson even said after the game is that they get too hyped for for these sort of situations. And uh, the the nerves get to them, I guess. I don't know. Like it, it's 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 weird. I don't know. Phil, there it is again. It's not weird. <laughs> it's not weird. And the Ravens did not beat themselves. They lost to the Pittsburgh Steelers and that tenacious defense. And if you hadn't noticed, and this is a T.J. Watt thing, but the Nick Herbig when he came from behind to knock that ball loose. They punched the ball out as if that ball had just stolen their wallet or something. And they do that on almost every play. They're punching. I can't believe they don't have broken hands. But, that I mean, there's little things like that that Pittsburgh does that uh, it's just a level of aggressiveness that they play with. 
And it almost seems, and I'm scared to death Thursday night. I told Dylan I'm scared to death of them coming off on a short week and have to play the Browns on Thursday night. But they play with a level of aggressiveness on defense. I keep People keep telling me you can't win with just defense. You can't win with just defense. But Pittsburgh just keeps winning with defense. And, you know, they, and they've field got goals. a better offense this year. But, and field goals. But, uh, but they've got a better offense this year for sure with Russell Wilson. That didn't really show up. You know, but even though they didn't get in the end zone, they still had drives. And they still kept the ball, and they still kept the defense mostly fresh for the majority of the game. And, I mean, that was just a typical game. And, I mean, all respect in the world, honestly, to, to Baltimore. Uh, they they play the way that Pittsburgh plays. But those games, there's no better rivalry. I don't care what people say about KC and Buffalo. There's no better rivalry in the NFL yes. than Pittsburgh and Baltimore, and there's no, there's no close second. That is the best rivalry in football. Uh, Rob, can I? There was a stat that I saw coming yeah. into the week that when when there's been a three or more point underdog in this in this series between the Ravens and, and the Steelers, that the underdog is actually eighteen four and two Whoa. against the spread, and. <laughs> so people always get this wrong. Is there another rivalry in sports where the game is always one possession at the end? It's a, it always comes down to one. The game is always within one possession. It's a, it's incredible. It's like it's so rare when this game is decided by more than eight points. Hey, did you stay up, Dylan, to watch the uh, Mike Tyson uh, Jake Paul fight? Unfortunately, was that the biggest waste of your life ever? I mean, that was. The undercard with the two women, Serrano and, I, and uh, Kate, uh, what was her name? I can't remember her last name. Uh, they wailed on each other for 10 rounds. That was amazing action. But the Tyson-Paul fight was just exactly what you thought it would be, a 58-year-old man fighting a 27-year-old who just learned how to box. It was nothing If to If watch. it wasn't on Netflix and I wasn't didn't just happen to already be up, I wouldn't have even bothered because I think that was pretty much what I expected. <laughs> I thought it was sad. It was. What, don't you think? I mean, just his, 60 million households tuned in for that fight. 60 million. It crashed the site, which makes you wonder how can Netflix carry a Christmas Day football game if they couldn't handle the audience for this fight? The site crashed several times. Yeah, you could tell in like the third or fourth round that that, that fight could have ended at any time that Jake Paul wanted it to. And yep. they had just, they just, they, they had probably agreed beforehand, hey, well, let's try to go eight rounds, you know. Eight two minute rounds. Yes, <laughs> eight two minute rounds. <laughs> the, I like the two minute round, by the way. A lot more action in a two minute round than a three. Although not in the Tyson Paul fight, they didn't. There was no action in that fight at all. But in the undercard, there were those moments where <clears throat> Tyson tried to do some footwork, and it just it was just sad. It was, he looked every bit of fifty eight walking back to his. He corner. did. It, whose feet hurt? <laughs> it was just. It was just. It didn't. It. it well, he was, stepped on his toe. <laughs> that's on his toe as a pre-fight thing. So it's what, and the glove you know, chewing thing was just that. weird. Well, better that yeah, than that his ear, odd. right? There's that. I sat up and watched that and was disappointed. And like you guys, I was kind of sad. But there was, I, I, it left me wondering, like, why did I want to see this so bad? And I think there was a lot of people that either remember Mike Tyson in his heyday or they wanted to see, like, that power or that, that aggression that Mike Tyson can bring. And nobody likes Jake Paul. <laughs> so they wanted to see That's him true. knocked out. But, and I think yeah. it was just that hope that can we get a glimpse, can we get two minutes of what Mike Tyson was and knock this punk out. But it, it didn't take long to realize, like, no, nah, this ain't going to happen. He took a couple swings early, and then you just knew, like, no. Nah. And it, it, it was sad. It made, me feel, it made me feel bad, honestly. I know Mike Tyson's had his history, but it made me feel bad for him as a human that he – He's not in a position in life after all that he had accomplished where he didn't need that money, and he kind of sold his pride a little bit. I thought it was embarrassing for him. Um, it pride a little bit just to get a, a, a paycheck. And, you know, you go looking back at the end of his career, and, you know, we, we kind of forget that. It's like forgetting Jordan playing for the Wizards. But you look at the end of his career, and he was beaten badly in, I think, four of his last five fights to no-name guys. And I think one of them, he just quit. Yeah. And, you know, so, so that that desire that I had to see the Mike Tyson from when I was in high school and college, you know, I was like, where did that – they sold me on that because if you just look back 20 years ago, he wasn't that when he was 38, much less 58. So I was kind of sad for him. But I would say those undercards, as an old boxing fan, me and my dad used to watch boxing all the time, that those – I thought all of the undercards were really good fights, all mm -hmm. of them 
were were really impressive fights. And they should have started they should have started with Paul and Tyson first and led up to the two women boxers. Those women are tough, man. Those, those uh both of them and I didn't agree with the the the, the judges. Yeah, what was but that? Both of those women are I don't know, I didn't agree with it, but the uh, both of them, I it, it was it was unbelievable. But um you know, I, I felt I, I was sad for Tyson and it, you know, I, I wanted so bad just to see one of those uppercuts and just knock him out in the first round, and that we we didn't see that at all. Let's talk money, Phil. Friday was a pretty bad day for the markets, uh, and uh, this morning, Nasdaq is up slightly, but the Dow and the S and P are either negative or bouncing back and forth between negative or slightly positive. What is uh, what is driving the concern on Wall Street right now? Nobody wants to hear this. But what Friday was was, you know, inflation readings that kind of didn't didn't meet what we had expected them to meet, and words from the Federal Reserve that basically said higher for longer, or we don't need to be in a hurry to cut rates. And I don't know that that's a massive surprise. You know, on this battle with inflation, uh, it started to trickle back up, and the trend has been more flat and on its way down. So therefore, the Federal Reserve said, "Hey, there's no reason for us to jump the gun." Employment numbers still look pretty good, uh, but inflation starting to go the opposite direction. And there's like a last thousand yards for this soft landing. And it's not a surprise. And I don't know that it's a reason to run for the hills either. It's just uh, as the path goes on, they have said all along we're data dependent. And that data last week had said, hey, you don't need to cut rates or you don't need to be in a hurry to cut rates. And that's all Jerome Powell told us. Now, having said that, the, 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 the distance of the fall on Friday was due to the run-up that we had leading up to. So after the post-election run-up, and it's not to say that, hey, we changed our mind about what what had happened post-election, but it was to say that there's more to sell off because of a huge jump that we got post-election. But it is the Federal Reserve, and it's a, it's a reminder. Nobody wants to hear me talk about drying, including me. Nobody wants to hear uh, more talk about the Federal Reserve and interest rates, but that's exactly what that was on Friday. I don't think it's a reason to run. I don't think it's a reason to panic. It's just a battle with inflation. They may need to slow down just a little bit. The good news, though, this week is we get earnings from NVIDIA, and good or bad, that will put the focus on what is one of the largest companies in the world. It will put the focus on that, and that will have, it should have, some type of impact on the S&P and NASDAQ, hopefully a positive impact. But Wednesday after the close, we get that highly anticipated NVIDIA return. NVIDIA has reached the point now, Phil, where the expectations are so high that even if they beat, if they didn't blow it out beat, mm -hmm. it's not good enough. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough expectation to meet each time now. Yes, and, and, and eventually they won't be able to meet it, but you're exactly right. It's almost like kind of, I don't want to analogize with sports, but it's almost like Martinsburg football. You know, if they don't beat someone 60 to nothing, then you think they're having a down year, and then it's not the case at all. Sometimes it's just that they can't keep up with those expectations, but they do have lofty expectations. But having said that, they're still fairly, it's fairly new into this AI, artificial intelligence game that they have been the for, on the forefront of. If you went back a decade ago, and NVIDIA, while it was a good, strong company, it was known as a gaming company, and it really didn't, you know, it didn't reach the, the limits of where it was a market mover. But now it's jumped that list to, and I think it's the largest by capitaliz market capitalization, I think it's the largest company in the world. Tesla, Phil, up 8% in pre-market trading. And the rumor is that the Trump administration will relax regulations on self-driving vehicles. And this has caused Tesla stock to further uh, move north. They're, like I said, up another 8% uh, this morning. So I don't know that the rumors are true or not, but that seems to be enough to make the stock go on another run. The rumors and perception and perception because he was such a big supporter of Trump that maybe that would curry favor uh, in, in the Trump administration, and, and I can't say that I, I feel much differently. But for the EV world, if you you know, we, let's rewind uh, just a few years ago, where we had felt like anyway that Republicans were maybe uh, the enemy of electric vehicles, and Democrats were the friends of electric vehicles. And with with this combination of Elon Musk and Donald Trump, it now appears that everyone 
is friends of the, of the electric vehicles, Tesla in particular. So you've got this driverless robo taxi that there's been a lot of talk about and 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 that could change you know you think of the uber and lyft about uh maybe a decade ago or 15 years ago and on a micro level i'm thinking of my family where we wouldn't have dared taking an uber or lyft or put my wife or my kid in an uber or lyft but now that is the way to travel and I, we've probably taken 200 uber or lyft trips now and we do it without without hesitation or without thinking twice and can tesla and this driverless vehicle take away that market from Uber and Lyft in bigger cities and, and where you would normally have rented a car. Now you have someone coming, you have something coming to pick you up and take you where you're going, and there's not even a human in the car. And can they take over for Uber and Lyft? So there's a lot of potential there. And with the perception, and like you said, the rumors, their regulations on that would be really, really light. That's the reason it's run up the way that it has. And and you don't see an end in sight until you hear that some of these rumors aren't true. Bill, you're staring at me. I know you want to say something about Tesla. No, I say keep it coming, keep it coming. Yeah. <laughs> now, there, there, there's a lot of skepticism about the, uh, the remote operating the capability of automobiles. Uh, and I'll use my example. You <laughs> yeah, you think. But I'm going to use mine as an example of one which is not statistically valid in any sense at all. But I feel a lot safer in my car when the Tesla is driving itself than when I'm driving it. <laughs> That might be that might be an indictment of your own driving, it, 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 uh, Rob. It's becoming <laughs> that way. Exactly right. I'll admit it's to not, that. But I'll it's admit a to micro that. example. Yeah. And and I think that's a very valid example because you hear a lot of that. And micro examples are exactly what leads perception. And you know the uh, I've heard that from more than one person that that has a Tesla that that gave in and said, Hey, I'm going to let it drive me somewhere. And you start off with little tests. I'm going to do it in my development, or I'm going to do it from here to there. And next thing you know, it's pretty much taking you everywhere that you go. So as this becomes more mainstream, people will be, become more confident in it. And you're going to hear stories where something had gone sideways. I'm sure you will. But the, but, and, and, of course, they'll be spread by naysayers. But th this is the way. And we've known this for a long time with these EVs. There, there's, there's, there's bumps in the road. There's ugly pickup trucks. Or, or there, you heard of an exploding battery or you hear these things. But by and large, the majority of what you hear is positive. And that's why we've seen Tesla run the way that it has ran. And now that it's removed some of the political roadblock, if you will, what is to stop it? You know, there, it's in favor on both sides of the aisle. And now more and more people will be, and it's just true. I, I don't want to get political, but it's true. Because Elon Musk was a big supporter of Trump, there will be more people that are, are, are uh, more likely to use or consider an electric vehicle yep. simply because of that. And, and it's true. And it, you know, it sounds crazy, like, well, just because of the political party? Yes, absolutely because of the political party. Look at vaccines in 2020. You know, everybody on one side of the aisle was all for them. Look how fast we created this. And the second that the election changed, no, it completely flipped. All the Democrats wanted uh, vaccine, and none of the Republicans did, and it happened overnight. And I see that sort of movement right now with Tesla, except for there's no roadblocks on the other side of the aisle. And Phil, if the question becomes, is Tesla a tech company or, or an automobile manufacturer? Their PE is 88, Ford's is 12. And i got 30 seconds left, Phil. How do, uh, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thanks, Phil. Go Steelers. <laughs>